Welcome to the Nemeth Report podcast. Hello, I'm Dr. Tammy Nemeth, historian and independent researcher, and I'll be your host. Today's podcast episode will explore the issues of COP26. That's the international climate meeting being held in Glasgow later this year. The push towards net zero and green financing. My guest today will be Michelle Sterling from the Friends of Science. Since the first Earth Day in 1970, there have been lots of different environmental catastrophes lurking just around the corner. Resource depletion, overpopulation, biosphere degradation, global cooling, global warming, and now climate change. The villain in these scenarios? Why, that's you, that's me, and industrial civilization. Large amounts of scientific data have demonstrated that none of the most hyped doom and gloom predictions made by environmentalists and their supporters have proved accurate. Yet these ideas have become entrenched in the global agenda through the United Nations and its sustainable development goals. So here we are in 2021 with global leaders actually listening to these prognosticators of alarm and doom and planning to fundamentally transform how whole national economies operate, how investments are made and business is done through ESG scores, and ultimately how people live in the planned net zero world. Before we have this conversation, though, it's important to establish a bit of background for how we got to this point. This global agenda is very much a project of the United Nations through its UN Environment Program, its Information Gathering and Assessment Body, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, and the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC. The UN Environment Programme was established in 1972 out of the Stockholm Conference with the intent to coordinate international consideration of global environmental issues. Out of UNEP came the IPCC, which was created in 1988 to scientifically study the hypothesis that the human production of greenhouse gases is causing global warming. Natural causes were not really considered. The UN Framework Convention on Climate Change was created in 1995 and convened the first Conference of the Parties, or COP, that same year to facilitate the negotiation of legally binding obligations for developed countries to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The first agreement was the Kyoto Protocol in 1998, and in 2015, the Paris Agreement was agreed upon that committed signatories to a pathway to net zero emissions by 2050. Just to be clear, Russia, China, India, Africa, and developing Asia are essentially exempt from the same level of emission reductions that are being required by developed nations. And they are to be compensated out of a pool of $100 billion per year that developed countries are supposed to donate to. To put this into perspective, China's emissions are as much as the other top five emitters combined. Canada is not in the top six. Now, the UN process was sold to countries as being rooted in scientific inquiry, but it has devolved into dogma to the point where scientists and scientific studies that challenge the narrative of human-caused global warming are dismissed as heretical, usually being labeled as deniers, with all of the emotional stigma attached to that label from the Holocaust. This message of environmental catastrophe due solely to human activity has been around for a while seeping into our collective consciousness, and it is being used as a vehicle to further an agenda that has at its core the replacement of the post-enlightenment Western industrial capitalist way of life. By the terms of the Paris Agreement, each signatory must provide five-year plans, just like in Communist China and the former Soviet Union, and must provide an accounting of their progress towards their net zero ambitions. One thing that negotiators realized from the outset was that the great transformation or great reset and fundamental energy transition was very likely to fail without cooperation from corporations and financial institutions. Someone has to pay for it all. As long as there was money to be made with the more efficient, affordable and reliable hydrocarbon industry, investment would not be forthcoming for the inefficient, expensive and unreliable renewable energy industry and all that goes with it. The question was how to make this shift happen. One of the goals of the transnational progressive movement has been to try and divert private investment away from hydrocarbons to kill the private petroleum and coal sectors and have that money be redirected into progressive approved initiatives like the green economy. 
One way is to use foundations to fund ENGOs to relentlessly attack the petroleum and coal industries that are the arteries, the keystone of our technological modern way of life. Another way is through changes to finance. I'd like to take a moment, if you'll bear with me, to establish a bit of context here. Private financing of the big green transformation has been the goal of people like Mark Carney and Mike Bloomberg for some time. In December 2015, concurrent with the Paris Agreement negotiations of COP21, Carney and Bloomberg established the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, or TCFD. The purpose was to establish voluntary financial climate risk disclosures for large companies and institutions. Of course, the goal now is to make these disclosures mandatory. How long before this trickles down to smaller companies and even to individual citizens? Not too long if advocates for this get their way. In Mark Carney's words, in a webinar discussion last year, he said, and I quote, it needs to be made mandatory so that it extends, you know, across all sectors. The goal is to have subnational, regional, municipal, and other governments engaged and have their own commitments so that this is cascading down, that it's not just at the multilateral level or national level, but it's coming down to the level of our communities, our companies, our communities, our schools, our institutions, and what are, are we all doing to move towards these objectives, end quote. What will this mean for the average Canadian or average citizen? According to those in the ruling class like Mark Carney, in order to save the world from human-caused global warming and a so-called climate emergency, which we are not allowed to question, we must all offer an accounting of our own individual personal environmental impact. The penance that will come with it might mean reduced access to banking credit, increased interest in bank charges, higher insurance premiums, reduced access to government services, intermittent and expensive energy, higher food costs, downsized living, and personal emissions tracking, to name a few possible outcomes. Life in a net zero world, with the rule book being finalized in Glasgow at COP26 in November this year, will bear little resemblance to the standard of living or way of life we are used to. It is a form of technocratic totalitarianism. The costs of net zero to our civilization and humanity are too high, and the benefits of hydrocarbons to human flourishing never seem to enter the equation. Our current system may not be perfect, but it has improved the care of our environment and planet unlike any others. This is a system worth keeping and fighting for. Today I'll be speaking with Michelle Sterling of the Friends of Science on these issues of COP26, the net zero transition, and green financing. Michelle is the Contract Communications Manager for Friends of Science Society. She has worked in marketing communications, advertising, and film video production most of her career. Michelle also did a 10-year stint in Israel during the high-tech and science tech boom of that startup nation, working with many advanced industries in aerospace, defense, software, telecom, desalination engineering, agriculture, and biofarm. Upon her return to Canada, she worked for a time at Alberta Environment as an information coordinator the year that the Sierra Club gave Alberta an F and Ontario a B plus. That jump started her interest in climate change policies and the Tar Sands Campaign, which is the foreign funded green trade war against Alberta. Michelle was an op-ed writer for the Red Deer Advocate for several years and has contributed articles to the Calgary Herald, Edmonton Journal, Troy Media and Medium. Several of her papers on climate change consensus thinking and ecofeminism that are posted on the Social Science Research Network are in the top 10% of downloads. Michelle has published a number of ebooks on Amazon Kindle, including a fun children's climate change story, the start of a series. She was a member of the Canadian Association of Journalists and American Association for the Advancement of Science. Hi, Michelle. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, Hello, Tammy. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you. Um, can you tell listeners of this podcast about the Friends of Science Society? What's the story about why people came together to form the Friends of Science? Sure. Uh, back in the days of Kyoto, uh, which is, as you mentioned, a forerunner to the Paris Agreement, a group of uh, retired and semi-retired professional engineers, professional geophysicists and geoscientists in, in Calgary, and a couple of other business people thought that the Kyoto Accord would be 
economically destructive and uh, that the science really wasn't very profound. So they thought that it would be important to, you know, write up some papers and offer some information to the public and politicians. And, you know, at the time they just sort of started it as a retirement hobby. And here we are almost 20 years later, <laughs> we're in our 19th year now, um, you know, still trying to get climate science insights out there and get some common sense and uh, boots on the ground rationality into the conversation about climate and energy policies. Well, you know, the rationale given for urgently pursuing drastic changes to the Canadian and global economies um, is that there is this global climate emergency. So we have many cities, provincial and state authorities, and some nations making this declaration of a climate emergency. But is that so? Is there a climate emergency with tipping points being reached, mass extinctions, and finite carbon budgets? Well, um, you know, the source of this uh, emergency, if you like, is probably stemming from the use of what's known as RCP 8.5, which is representative concentration pathway. It's one of a modeled scenario that um, was intended to help researchers understand what the different kinds of forcings are. These are the factors that, you know, move climate in one direction or another, uh, temperatures in one direction or another. Um, but the people who designed this, um, scenario, this set of scenarios actually never intended that they should be used as projections and they never intended that they should be compared either, which we, we, we see scientists doing this all the time. We actually have on video, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe comparing RCP 8.5, which is a catastrophically hot world with uh, RCP 4.5, which is kind of a normal world. Uh, but they're not intended to be used that way. So Roger PLK Jr. and Justin Ritchie have shown that much of the catastrophic thinking about climate is based on outdated science and on this very scenario. And in fact, um, he's also revealed that um, green billionaires, Michael Bloomberg and uh, Tom Steyer, got together with some environmentalists in 2014 and published a report called Risky Business, which is all based on RCP 8.5. And that proliferated throughout the financial community. That's where this fear mongering comes from. Now, on the other hand, um, the climate emergency also stems from the Club of Rome and they have uh, a uh, booklet out you know, promoting the climate emergency and the fact that the only thing that will save us is wind and solar, which is absurd. And another woman named Margaret Klein Solomon, who is a clinical psychologist in the United States, also developed the, you know, our houses on fire themes, the ones that Greta uses. Uh, she's right. got a project right. called Climate Mobilization, and she's written a book about, you know, face the climate truth. Um, and she's um, very influential, but, you know, she's using these psychological tactics to scare people into compliance, which is um, not scientific and not ethical, in my opinion. But um, so that's where these climate emergencies come from. I believe also the uh, Stockholm Resilience Center and, um, and the Potsdam Climate Institute out of Germany they have developed a number of rather fear-mongering ideas of uh, tipping points. And um, ironically, when you look at one of their graphs, which was in a, um, a paper called Trajectories, which was published in uh, August of 2018, I believe it was, uh, showing that while the, the Earth is like this bowling ball that's going to roll off into a hot... <laughs> <laughs> 80s, you know, it's a really kind of a ridiculous looking illustration, but there are no parameters on that graph whatsoever. You know, it's not a scientific graph. It's an illustration that's meant to scare people. And I also did a rebuttal paper to that because I see it really as an advertising op-ed, uh, what they wrote, not a scientific paper. But um, right. right. Yeah. So and that, there's that's a where lot the emergency, out there. Yeah. That's where the emergency is coming from. Um, 
But then this also gets picked up in the media, right? So then they start talking about more extreme weather events, that there's mass species extinction, there's biodiversity loss, there's, like you said, the tipping points and the the 1.5 degree limit. Where did they get these numbers from? And are they accurate in any of those statements? Well, the, um, the 1.5 or 2 degree target Actually, according to Ted Nordhaus, of, uh, I believe he's with the Breakthrough Institute, and he is the nephew of William Nordhaus, the uh, Nobel Prize winning economist. He says in Foreign Affairs, and I'll just read this bit to you so it's clear. My uncle, the Yale University economist, William Nordhaus, is widely credited with being the first person to propose that climate policy should strive to lim limit anthropogenic global warming to two degrees above pre-industrial temperatures. He did not arrive at that conclusion through any sort of elaborate climate modeling or cost-benefit analysis. Rather, he considered the very limited evidence of long-term climate variance available at that time, which was about 40 years ago, and concluded that a two-degree increase would take global temperatures outside the range experienced by human societies for the previous several thousand years and probably much longer. The standard was, by his own admission, arbitrary. So, <laughs> you know, isn't that ridiculous? We're, you know, turning the world upside down over these arbitrary targets. And not to mention, you know, this whole notion of uh, global average temperature is actually quite ridiculous. And I think that um, Professor Ross McKittrick and uh, Christopher Essex have written a paper about how um, it's, it's really not, there isn't such a thing as a global average temperature. And uh, you can even see what NASA has to say about the uh, surface average temperature and how impossible it is to actually establish that. You'd have to have banks of temperature monitors, you know, at, at every level going up into the sky because the temperature near the earth is one temperature and you can go up five meters and it's a completely different temperature. So, you know, it, it, it's really um, quite a boondoggle when people are, are getting hysterical about this, these small changes in, in degrees of temperature. And I think actually Professor Richard Lindzen in his talk, the imaginary climate crisis shows how ridiculous it is to think that a one or, or a half degree warming would be catastrophic when people regularly experience vast sweeps of temperature change in a day or over the course of a year. So Exactly. And how do we know what an ideal global temperature ought to be? I mean, exactly. based on what? What's our frame of reference for that? I mean... If we look historically, and I find it as a historian very problematic when I see people trying to pretend there was no medieval warming period, where they just try <laughs> to pretend that history doesn't exist, when there's there's quite a lot. And in fact, I saw a post for a call for papers talking exactly about the medieval warming period and how that contributed to various um innovations in governance and societies and so on that that's going to be held this fall. So historians seem to have one viewpoint and then there's people who have a who are trying to pretend like these things have never happened. Yes, actually I think two of the best books I've ever read about climate change are historical books and um they're written by Brian Fagan. One is called The Great Warming, and that is about the medieval warm period. And the other is uh, The Little Ice Age, How Climate Changed History. Mm -hmm. And both of them are very readable. There's lots of sidebars of science in there, but you don't have to read that part if you're not interested. But most of it is in a very um, plain language format. And it's great to have, you know, actual historical vignettes from people's diaries you know, noting what, what things are going on. And uh, especially in the Little Ice Age, which was horrific, you know, terrible time for people. So that's right. Yeah, yeah with, a, with famines. And, you know, if you think about how people tried to keep warm in those days, it would have been extremely difficult. And there was lots of disease and, and, and a lot of people died because of the cooling, <laughs> not because it got warmer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I, I just uh, have a note here that I wanted to mention, you know, people should know that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which creates the science, economic, socioeconomic and impact Bibles, if you like, 
every six years. Um, they also create this thing called the summary for policymakers, and it's about a 30 page long summary of, you know, several thousand pages of. Of uh, accumulated research and that thing is written. Uh, and approved line by line in a room full of political delegates from across all the countries. So, this is done in a marathon session of about a week. They project it on the screen. They highlight each line in green highlighter and go through and approve each single line. So, this is a political document, but that's what your government is setting its policies on. Right. And, so and that's certain. also what the journalists report on. So, it's not exactly. just the policymakers, but also in constructing the narrative that this is what we need to do to move forward. Right. And also Donna Laframboise showed in her books, a delinquent teenager that Greenpeace and World Wild Fund legends are lead authors within the IPCC. And the IPCC reports often cite Greenpeace press releases. <laughs> so that's not very right. sciencey. <laughs> Well, and, you know, imagine if Exxon or Chevron or somebody wanted to contribute. A paper, what would the, what would the reaction be? Well, I think originally they did. I think originally some of the, uh, um. Major companies, oil and gas companies, I think that some of the works of some of their people were part of the review. But, you know, that quickly fell out of favor. And I mean, if you look at Exxon, you know, from very early on. They, uh, you know, people say, oh, well, they were funding disinformation by running these big ads, uh, you know, Supran and Oreskes have a paper out on that, uh, which I also rebutted in one of my SSRN papers. But um, they, uh, you know, Exxon was trying to have a, an open, reasonable, civil, public, scientific conversation, you know, showing the public that there are many uncertainties in climate science and, you um, you know, that people should be aware of that and uh, we should have open civil dialogue on it and that the uh, energy policies that were being set, you know, could be very destructive to society. Of course, everyone passed that off and said, oh, they're just worried about their own business. Well, you know, they know what's going to happen if people don't have fossil fuels. It's going to be a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> Right. Um, I, one of the things I find interesting is that you, we have the IPCC. They go to all this work and the scientists contribute, like you said, thousands of pages and um, some very detailed research. And then the, the summary for policymakers, I mean, nowhere in the IPCC does it talk about that climate change or what we've seen so far has caused extreme weather events. And yet this gets Put in the media, whenever there's some kind of weather event, they say, oh, look, extreme weather, there's going to be more extreme weather and it's caused by climate change. And they try to say that the scientists are saying this, but it's not true. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. In fact, in 2012, the IPCC issued a report, which was a special report on extreme weather. And that was the conclusion that they drew was that actually extreme weather is integral to climate. And uh, these events uh, are not increasing. There's no trend increasing these events. Um, Roger PLK Jr. has a book out called uh, The Proper Role of Science, I believe it is, uh, Disasters and Climate Change. Uh, you can look it up under his name anyway. It's a very good book. He's been following extreme weather trends for years and re he reports to insurance companies. So, uh, you know, he's quite a reliable. Uh, scientist in that regard. And, uh, you know, the media just love the uh, doom and gloom. And, and actually, as a historian, you probably recognize this from the medieval times. Um, I have a copy of this wonderful book called the book of miracles. <laughs> which, <laughs> which is from, like, the 1400s, I believe in Augsburg and uh, there's images there of, you know, flames coming down from the sky and, you know, people couldn't explain the strange things that were happening. In in climate of that era, um, and so they they came up with these kind of crazy stories, just like today. You know, where uh, actually in that time, many women uh, were burnt at the stake for the crime of weather cooking with the help of Satan. 
because the <laughs> weather was so unbalanced and, and erratic in the Little Ice Age that that's the conclusion people drew. And uh, Dr. Sally Bellyunis has a great video of that where she makes a comparison to today where people like me and our organization, you know, we would have been burnt at the stake. <laughs> For questioning. Yes. Yeah. Um, so if I, if I can just take us back a little bit to the IPCC mm -hmm. and, you know, they, they have these projections, like you talk about the RCP 8.5, which is a modeled mm -hmm. scenario and it's based with the computer models. And, you know, we've got, since they, put satellites up in space and and we have all of these weather temperature monitoring things all over there and they've been making predictions for 40 years and if we look at what the computer model predictions are um they don't seem to do so well predicting the future of 20 30 years and we're now supposed to be trusting these models which have been disastrous and wrong like very wrong for planning to up for the next 20 or 30 years. So from my perspective, these com these models aren't necessarily so reliable. What's the perspective of Friends of Science? Well, yes, yeah, so when we think the models are tremendously faulty. And of course, many uh, scientists have said quite point blank that the models are only useful for understanding climate, but they're useless for predicting climate or projecting climate. Um, you know, I think, as you mentioned early on, uh, one thing to remember, the IPCC's mandate is to figure out the human causation of climate change, not all forms of climate change. So the natural factors are not well studied within the IPCC uh, reports. And I think it's also important to look at uh, Roger Pielke Jr.'s work again, he did a great paper in 2005 called Misdefining Climate Change. And you see there's two definitions that are quite different. There's the UNFCCC, the COP definition, which is, you know, the, that they want to stabilize emissions, GHG emissions in the atmosphere to stop dangerous anthropogenic uh, global warming. So, you know, there's this subjective word in there, dangerous, right? But the the um, IPCC definition is quite different, and it's really that, you know, climate change is uh, a statistically evident change in climate over a period of time that can be caused by human or natural factors or both. So, you know, one is far more scientific and, and not emotional, but the COP one is very emotion. It was that dangerous anthropogenic climate, you know, so they've made an assumption. They made that back in, in uh, what, 1995, did you say, when they formed the... Uh, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so anyway, but the models are not reliable. They have lots of shortcuts built into them. And uh, Professor Christopher Essex and also um, Professor Ross McKittrick have done a lot of work on that. And even Steve Coonan, who recently wrote a book called uh, uncertainty, I believe. Uh, unsettled. Which, unsettled, that's it, yes. Yeah. When he was chairing the workshop for the American Physical Society in 2014, um, there were about six scientists there. Uh, three would probably be deemed rather skeptical and three would be deemed to be rather on board. But he's, uh, he's asking them these questions and saying, you know, um, modeled simulated responses to forcings, including greenhouse gas forcings, can be scaled up or down. To match observations, some of the forcings in some of the models had to be scaled down. But when it came to making centennial projections, so 100 years out, the scaling factors were removed, which yeah. probably resulted in a 25 to 30 percent over projection of the 2100 warming. So uh, the transcript is, you know, quite amazing because he, Dr. Coonan saying, if the model tells you you got the response to the forcing wrong by 30%, you should use that same 30% factor when you project out a century. And Dr. Collins says, yes, and uh, one of the reasons we're not doing that is we're not using the models as a statistical projection tool. So Dr. Coonan <laughs> says, well, what are you using them as? And Dr. Collins says, well, we took exactly the same models that got the forcing wrong, which sort of got the projections wrong up to 2100. So Kunin says, well, why do you even show a centennial scale projection? 
And Colin says, well, I mean, it is part of the IPCC assessment process. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, so what's part of an assessment process? It's not a scientific justification for using assumptions that are known to be empirically wrong to produce projections that help drive the political narrative of a planet spinning toward a climate catastrophe. <laughs> Well, and you know, it's not the first time that that sort of thing has been done. I mean, back in 2009, we had the, the climate gate email um, mm -hmm. thing that happened where there were these emails that had been released to various people showing that there was a concerted effort to prevent uh, any scientists who were somewhat skeptical or pro providing different evidence, different studies explaining that maybe huma humans aren't causing this type of climate change that they're saying is happening to prevent them from publishing to mm -hmm. say, okay, if we, do, if that editor is not going to play ball with us, then we need to get rid of that editor or, you know, the, these other things. So on the one hand, they're saying, oh, look, these guys aren't peer reviewed, but, uh, but on the other hand, they're trying to prevent them from being peer reviewed. Yes, exactly. And also the, in those climate gate emails, interestingly enough, uh, at one point, the World Wild Fund came back to some of the researchers saying, like, you have to hype this up a bit. You know, so what yes. is this agenda driven green group doing telling uh, scientists, you know, how to write their paper like that? This is a terrible conflict of interest. And of course, the general public are not aware of any of this. And uh, they, I understand they're making a movie now about this uh, climate gate trying to show how the poor scientists were, <laughs> you know, were, were um, uh, denigrated by the release of these emails, which they wrote. <laughs> right. And, you know, here in the UK, what they did was they, they convened, of course, a commission to mm -hmm. investigate how these emails got released. And then they were supposed to not necessarily investigate the content of them, but mm -hmm. Everyone was assuming that's what the commission was for, but it wasn't. So they didn't say anything about it. And then soon after that, the BBC said, well, we're not going to include discussion of climate skeptics on any of our shows. So right. it, it was just sort of like, oh, no, we got caught. We'll do a little waving around that we're investigating things, but we're just going to double down and, and press on. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. Which brings me to the point about the 97%, because if they're trying to say that 97% of scientists agree on human-caused global warming and climate change, and that only real peer-reviewed scientists are permitted to speak on the issue, but yet scientists are prevented from being peer-reviewed. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess there's two issues there. One, there's the the 97%, which I, I've looked at the... Uh, the review studies about that and just how atrocious that claim was. And then the second issue would be the, the peer review part. Well, yes, the 97% uh, is, is really, that is an advertising technique that's called a social proof. And uh, Robert Cialdini has done a lot of work on the most influential um, advertising techniques. And that is certainly one of them. Uh, and that, you know, there's also the, corollary to that, that the remaining 3% are heretics and ostracized. And Kipling D. Williams, who's a psychologist, has done a lot of work on the pain of being ostracized. And, and actually, they found that being ostracized is as painful, physically painful, uh, as if you're physically hurting someone. So um, these two numbers work in concert with each other on the human psyche. But when you do look at the 97% surveys and we did a complete report on that using the top four or five surveys you find that in one case doron and zimmerman for instance um, they used opinion questions on an empirical topic so oh. you know that's a useless <laughs> kind of survey and out of a pool of ten thousand, they had 3100 or some respondents of which they chose uh, 79 people who said they were publishing something on climate change and of those 77 and 76 um, responded uh, affirmatively to their opinion questions. Now, 
Zimmerman did the original work and she got dozens of emails from scientists saying, well, it's the sun that's driving climate change. <laughs> so she published all these emails in her MA thesis, which is called the consensus on the consensus. And at the conclusion of her study, she said, she herself said, you know, after reading all the different uh, viewpoints and arguments, I'm actually more neutral than I was when I started. And yet they still published this, this uh, paper claiming 97% of scientists agree. So oh. science is not a democracy. That's what Dr. Nir Shaviv says. And so uh, it, it doesn't matter if 100% of the scientists agree. As Albert Einstein said once, you know, if why did they need a hundred? If I was wrong, they only need one. Exactly. exactly. One of the the interesting things I read for one of the ninety seven percent things was, and and I don't know if this is right, um, is that when they were doing this meta analysis, they were they had looked through different um, studies. And if at some point in the article, it mentioned global warming, climate change, or whatever, then that was counted as mm -hmm. in support of, of whatever position they were looking for. But it, I, if I remember correctly, in the ClimateGate emails, they were saying about how sometimes editors would insert statements in the introduction or conclusion or get authors to put some kind of statement in there even if um, their studies didn't actually prove it one way or another? Um, I don't remember that from ClimateGate, although I must say I haven't studied those in depth, but uh, it is true, I believe, of um, Nomi Oreski's first, she was the first consensus study that got wide attention, and that was in 2004. It's called Beyond the Ivory Tower. And uh, she came up with the 97% based on these keywords, which in fact, in her published study were wrong. She had to issue a correction. And at the time, Roger PLK Jr. also spoke up and said, hey, you know, uh, you can't come up with a consensus and claim that things are settled when, you know, that precludes further study and more robust discussion. Um, so he's also published, his letter is published in that same science uh, article. Um, but um, when uh, I think it was Benny Pizer, Dr. Benny Pizer did a breakdown, he redid the um, Oreski study and he found that um, only a handful, like about 13 of the peer reviewed papers actually explicitly agreed with anthropogenic global warming. And 470 of them had no opinion whatsoever. It just had the words global warming or climate change mentioned in the paper. Right. So, right. so uh, of the 900, like only maybe 40, because there were implicit agreement and explicit agreement of 13. Uh, so it was maybe 40 papers, I think, that ex explicitly and implicitly agreed. Uh, with uh, AGW and the rest were talking about uh, anything else, <laughs> you know, oh, right. um, um, mitigation methods. Um, some had no opinion whatsoever, as I said, 470. So it's really, and that's the number that was used in in um, Al Gore's movie. Al Gore's, you know? yeah. So that's why it also became very famous. Right, because then that's all people hear. They hear, oh, 97% yeah. and... And uh, oh, the scientists all agree, and so on, and and um, and so if you don't agree, like you said, you get ostracized and treated as if your your type of science isn't done properly or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yet you know, climate science is so complex, and the IPCC itself has even said in um, in their third assessment report of two thousand and one. They said, in climate research and modeling, we should recognize that we're dealing with a coupled, nonlinear, chaotic system, and therefore that long-term prediction of future climate states is not possible. <laughs> right. But the, you never see that quoted in the paper, do you? <laughs> no, not yeah. at all. Um, I wanted to sort of just step back a second and talk about mm -hmm. when you mentioned the sun, because 
this is a bit of an anecdote. In 2007, I was in a small town in Canada for a wedding. And in the local community weekly newspaper, David Suzuki had a regular column. And I remember he wrote that those who talk about the sun as being the driver of climate change were just creating a distraction for regular people. And that this diverted attention away from human caused global warming and climate change. What do you make of such a statement? Well, you know, this is the don't debate, just denigrate approach. And um, I would say that uh, James Hogan, who's a PR man and who started the smog blog, uh, he's been on the board of most of these foundations, uh, like the David Suzuki Foundation, Eco Justice, uh, West Coast Environmental Law. I may not have them all exactly right, but he's been a part of most of the environmental movement. And so this is like the Al Gore approach. You know, if you ask, if you question climate change with Al Gore, he'll just call you a denier, but he won't debate, right? So, um, you know, the sun is a complex body and we haven't really uh, studied it in as much detail as many of the things that we've studied on earth. So it's not easy to say this one thing about the sun is driving climate change because there are many, many factors of the sun that drive the climate system on earth. Uh, so, it, you know, it's a much easier sell to tell people, oh, it's carbon dioxide, it's you. And as you said in your opening, you know, you're guilty, you should pay the tax. Um, it's your fossil fuels and your use of them that is uh, causing warming rather than having people look at the long-term record because that's the only place that you actually see how the sun affects climate change. And there's a very close match on climate change and temperature on the long-term record with solar activity, but you don't see it in the short-term record. You know, and I work with a lot of professional geoscientists. You know, they, they think that 10,000 years is recent history. Yeah, that's <laughs> you know? right. So, so, you know, and the climateers are talking about the last 150 years. So the things that you see in 150 years of climate change are nothing compared to the long-term record of, of say 600 million years or 4.5 billion years. And, you know, they, as Dr. Harper used to say, we live on an active planet. So there are all kinds of processes going on within the planet, many of which are driven by solar activity, um, like tectonic plate movement, um, ocean cycles, you know, the, there are factors in solar activity that affect these things as well. Um, and we don't, these processes are very long. Um, so we just don't have the data to be able to say, oh, well, in the past hundred years, of course, it was only humans. It, you know, we, and, and so it's much more difficult to discuss this with people because it's far more scientific. And, uh, you know, David Suzuki is just out there raising money with his climate <laughs> catastrophe. If you send him a check, he'll stop it. Right. Right. Well, there's two things I just want to pick up with there. Uh, on the one hand, if you talk to people and you ask them, do you believe there's been ice ages in the past? And they'll go, well, of course there was. And if you say, well, OK, so what happened? What was the Earth like in between? Have we always been in an ice age or has been, there been multiple ice ages? And people will say, well, no, there's been different ones. And so if you ask them, so what was the temperature in between ice ages? Well, I don't know. I guess it was warm. And then if you say, well, you know what? We're living in an interglacial period. We're living in between ice ages. So don't you think then <laughs> that the temperature is going to be a little bit warmer? when it's not an ice age. And and then the second thing that I think is very interesting when talking about the sun is that there's, there's some scientists who have been studying solar activity for some time and they're extremely concerned that we are looking at the potential for solar minimum. Where, mm -hmm. if would you like to comment a little bit about the solar minimum aspect? Well, I can briefly, but I am not a scientist myself. I would refer people to the work of Dr. Nir Shaviv or to Dr. Habibulov Abdu Samatov, who uh, runs the Pulkolov uh, Observatory in Russia. 
And uh, we do have a PowerPoint from him on our blog. And he does see that there is a drop in solar activity and he foretells or projects a, a serious long-term solar minimum. And um, during these times of a solar minimum, it's like the little ice age that I spoke about earlier, um, which was uh, a Dalton or a Maunder minimum, it was called. Uh, but in those times, there's often frequent volcanic activity on a very large scale, which also generally causes cooling um, due to the uh, aerosols in the air. In fact, uh, the Lackey volcano blew up in, I think this, about this time in 1783. And um, for a short period of time, there was something like a four degree drop in temperature in the North, uh, Northern hemisphere because of Lackey and millions of people died because of the um, uh, volcanic gases that swept from Iceland into, um, into uh, the UK. Some people actually died from the sulfuric acid type of, of uh, aerosols and atmospheric gases. And uh, others died because of the various um, famines that were caused by the changes in climate. Now, right. of course, volcanoes are usually, um, you know, rather short term, but when you have a whole bunch of them back to back, which is what happened toward the end of the 1700s, um, then uh, that enhances the negative activity of the solar minimum. So it, it's, right. uh, it is deeply concerning because we're not preparing for that in any way and we should be. No. No. And what what concerns me also is that so I know that, of course, predictions of these kinds of things are immensely difficult. But there's some people who say that it could be possible bet between 2030, 2040, that that this minimum cycle starts to have a profound effect upon Earth's climate. But that's coincides with this push to bring in all of these regulations to curb carbon emissions and so on. And my concern is that then they'll take credit for for the cooling of the earth and say, look, that uh, what we did, what all these policies were worth it. Look, the earth is cooling. We should do more. We can do more and put people into an even more precarious position to deal with cooling when it does arise um, because they will have made all of these financial commitments um, that they're pushing us towards with COP26 and whatnot. Hmm, very interesting insight. Yes, that's quite possible. Um, you know, of course, when the uh, lockdowns happened last year, they were cheering because there was about an 8% drop in emissions, even though carbon dioxide concentration continued to rise dramatically. Right, right. Um, so obviously there are big natural factors that are more critical, but the UNEP has stated that it wants um, lockdowns, climate lockdowns every every year or every two years to drop 7.8% emissions to affect, uh, you know, the, the climate. But I mean, that, that will end up killing a lot of people just as the COVID lockdowns are killing a lot of people. That's right. Yeah. And, and I've heard that argument being made from many different places. So like, there's the economist Mariana Mazzucato's made this uh -huh. this argument, and then um, the Deutsche Bank researcher said, "Well, is the EU prepared to be an eco dictatorship? Because you're going to need something like a climate lockdown and massive control to get to the point that you're saying people need to get to, because uh -huh. uh, their lives are going to have to be changed and changed quickly. And how are you going to do that?" Um, one of the things I found really interesting is in 2019, Kristalina Georgieva, the head of the International Monetary Fund, was giving, they were doing these big talks or whatever in, in New York, I think it was, or Washington, I can't remember, with the IMF and the World Bank. Um, it was around the time of the big climate talks, I guess, at the UN and stuff in 2019. And she, from her perspective, um, the science on climate change was settled. 
that it was really just a matter of working out the details and finding a way to ensure compliance and enforcement of the Paris Agreement for Global Net Zero. Do the scientists and supporters of Friends of Science concur that the science is settled? Uh, no, the, the science is never settled. And, uh, you know, we also work closely with a group out of Holland called Clintel, Climate Intelligence Network. And they have 900, more than 900 scientists who say that there is no climate emergency, the science is not settled, it's far more complex than we think, and that natural factors are really the main drivers of climate. And there's so much more for us to know. But I think, uh, you know, again, you can see Donna Laframboise uh, did a presentation for us uh, around uh, Christmas time. It's on our YouTube channel. And it's about climate activism undermining your freedoms, and <laughs> as, which you just spoke about with the eco dictatorship. But it shows that many high pro profile people like this Kristalina and like Mark Carney, they're people who are not scientists at all, and they say these words with great authority. But the science is never settled, you know, until midway through the 1960s, early 70s, the theory of tectonic plate movement was not accepted at all in the geologic community. And now it's quite well accepted. But, you know, it takes a long time for science to um, reveal itself. And every time you peel back a layer of something scientific, there's another layer underneath it. So it, you can't just say, well, the science is settled and it will never, ever change. Uh, so it's absurd that we're making policies based on what these non-scientists claim. Yes, and just to speak to Clintel for a moment, um, I watched their their video stream when they were at the European Parliament, they were holding a, a sort of, they wanted to make their presentation and try to get the EU lawmakers to listen, like the, the various um, members of the European Parliament. So they're in this huge room and they have these scientists in the front, they have their PowerPoints ready to go, and I think there were two members of parliament who showed up, two out of, mm -hmm. you know, how many hundreds. And and the two people who showed up were there just to criticize them and say how wrong they were to even be there presenting. And well, it was it was quite stunning that here, you know, they're at the European Parliament, they're trying to present an alternative viewpoint, and they just really did not want to listen at all. Well, you know, you have to... Uh look, I think, at some of the geopolitical factors that are behind the climate movement. And I interviewed William Kay, who's a Canadian researcher, and he runs a blog called Ecofascism. And um, he brought some very interesting points forward that the green movement really does stem from Europe for the most part, and that Europe is spending about $600 billion a year to import fossil fuels because fossil fuels are not evenly distributed worldwide. So, you know, if you look at carbon markets, this might be seen perhaps as an equalization payment, if you like. So the fossil fuel rich parts of the world will be paying for their good luck to the fossil fuel poor parts of the world. And the way that that will happen is that if everybody has renewables like wind and solar, they generate these tradable renewable energy credits. Uh, so that's kind of the, the big picture on that. But, um, I, you know, it's a, there's only two countries in the world with large reserves of oil and gas in the democratic world, and that's the US and Canada. All the rest of them are state owned. And uh, if we go into these kinds of carbon markets, you know, democracy will be destroyed as will our industry, like we'll be crushed. Yes, yeah. and you know, the push for renewables, where do we get all the materials and whatnot for them? I mean, they, mm -hmm. they come from places that don't have the best environmental record, that employ child labor, that are controlled for the most part by China, um, the refining of these materials is controlled by China. If we look at the environmental footprint of renewables, it's crazy how much space they take up, how much mining is required, how much refining is required. And yet the environmentalists jump on that bandwagon and say, hey, we should all switch to renewables and complain about, you know, carbon dioxide or something. Um, and it's it's really rather appalling to to see them make that argument at the same time 
saying that we should not invest in small modular nuclear reactors, that we should not pursue any type of nuclear energy, that carbon capture utilization and storage should not be funded. So it it's like so if it's if you don't want to take the steps that will actually fix the problem you say is the problem, then what is it really about? Well, it is really about reforming society, as you mentioned off the top. It's, um, you know, I have this uh, piece from that from a Matthew Nisbet commentary that he did on the Climate Works Foundation and their beginnings. But this is actually from Bill McGiven in 1989. So McGiven argued in the End of Nature that uh, climate change, unlike other environmental problems, was not conventionally solvable. So our best hope was to avert the most devastating impacts. So the only possible path to survival was a fundamental reconsideration of our world views. And he thought in this pastoral future, free of consumerism or material ambition, Americans would rarely travel, experience the world instead via the internet, They'd grow much of their own food, power their communities with solar and wind, and divert their wealth to developing countries. Only under these transformational conditions, argued McGibbon, would we be able to set a moral example for countries like China to change course, all in the hope that these countries will accept a grand bargain toward a cleaner energy path. Now, um, ironically, well, first of all, he's been funded by the Rockefellers, as we know from Michael Moore's movie, Planet of the Humans. But ironically, we are living this life now in lockdown. And um, equally ironically, uh, Robert Lyman has put out a report called When Giants Arise, showing that the West makes up only 15% of the population in the world, 60% and growing is South Asia. So how do we think we're going to tell them what to do with their um, energy futures? while we, uh, you know, basically disembowel our society and make ourselves weak. Right. And it, what's interesting is that in many of the developing countries, the Europeans or who, whoever who believe in the, the climate change scenarios or whatever, go to the developing countries and say, we're not going to lend you money from the IMF or the World Bank unless you um, deal with corruption and you invest all this money or a big proportion of it into renewable energy and so on. But then China comes in with their development bank stuff and they say, you know what, we don't care whatever your governance is and we don't <laughs> care what um, energy you use. We just want your stuff and we'll give you money to make it so or to help you out so we can get access. So if it's in terms of geopolitical influence, um, there's no doubt, I think, that the Western governments lose their bit of influence in that respect because China will just come in and give them money and not care how they develop and, and they take the money and do what they want with it. So I know that there's some people within the IMF and World Bank communities who, who wish to change how they go about funding um, developing countries. But I think part of the Paris Agreement is you know they were, they're supposed to create like I mentioned the hundred billion dollars a year fund to mm -hmm. go to developing countries to help them go renewable or whatever, um, and it's just it's appalling that we're like giving money to other countries while shooting ourselves in the foot and allowing China to sort of be laughing all the way to the bank. Right and. Um... You know, the, the $100 billion a year Green Climate Fund has never attained its first $100 billion. It's, I think, been up to maybe $9 billion or something like that. Very, very far from the target. And if you recall, um, in September of 2019, Robert Lyman <clears throat> wrote an article about how China and India have been playing along with the climate game to some extent, and they both went to the New York Climate Conference with letters saying, pay up, we want our money yeah. now. So, yeah. uh, and why not? <laughs> the West doesn't have it. So, I think in the eyes of the West, they believe that this $100 billion will basically be circular funding for Western industries because, you know, the, the 
uh, climate industry is about a $1.5 trillion a year industry. And somebody's got to prop it up. So um, Professor Dr. Istvan Marko wrote a very interesting op-ed where he said that it's really like uh, these cops are really like a climate trade fair where, you know, all the countries get together and India would say to Germany, gee, you know, would be nice. Uh, yeah, we'd have renewables if we could afford it. So then Germany will say, well, we'll give you a um, billion dollars and then you can buy your renewables from Siemens and, you know, you can buy. <laughs> so <laughs> it really is money that's just channeled back to their country. So maybe that's what the real circular economy is about. But, you know, really it's crippling these developing nations. And of course, I, I don't even know if we can call China a developing nation anymore. It's developed, it's on hot on the tail of the US. So it will probably overtake the US in the next five years. Um, so I'm not sure why the West should be giving it charity. Exactly, especially when they, they comprise almost a third of the global carbon emissions. And then yeah. and they said they're not going to be, they'll be peaking at some point around 2040. I mean, they're still gonna be growing. Um, so to call them a developing nation, I think is inappropriate, but it it's almost like a kabuki theater to some extent on um, how these these things are arranged. And, and the same thing is with India. Like if you look at, if, if, if emissions are the really big problem, but you know more th almost half of the global emissions that are supposedly a problem are coming from countries who don't have to follow the paris agreement and mm -hmm. and whatnot then then what are we doing and especially canada which has such a low contribution really to the to the global situation and and we're going to be sacrificing our entire economy and way of life and it and then this brings me to the point of the precautionary principle, because this is what the environmentalists always throw out there. It's like, well, what if we're right and the earth is going to die if we don't stop temperatures rising by two degrees or whatever? And it's like, but at what point is is the death of humanity and, and people in the Western world, is is that acceptable? Yes, well, first of all, you know, the precautionary principle is being abused in this context because absolutely as as noted, this is something that no one can foretell. <laughs> and as noted, um, in 2013, the IPCC itself reported that there had been no statistically significant warming for the past 15 years, which was before Kyoto. And even to this day, there's been very little uh, statistically significant warming. It has, uh, can, it did uh, kick back in a little bit for a while, but it, it's really not at all on scale or par with the emissions. Um, so, you know, that tends to disprove the theory in some regard, the anthropogenic global warming theory. Um, now, of course, there may be other factors affecting it, but clearly the correlation is not there. So, um, you know, with regard to Canada, we put out about 1.6% uh, of the world's uh, emissions and China puts out in uh, one month what Canada puts out in a year and a half. So no matter what we do in Canada, it will not have any impact on climate, but it certainly will destroy our economy. It will indebt our children and it will lead to lots of people dying from heat or eat poverty. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Especially energy poverty. I mean, even here in the UK, at which has a temperate climate, um, every every year we hear it in the winter time where it's very damp and cold and um, not as bad as Canada, but bad for here. You know, people are mm -hmm. dying because they can't afford their their energy bills. And when we lived in Germany, it was it was just awful. The the cost of our utilities it was more than the cost of our mortgage and we knew people who wouldn't um they wouldn't heat some of the rooms in their house so they had doors separating every part of the house because they would only heat the room they were going to be in and mm -hmm. even then sometimes you know you walk into someone's house 
it was about it was winter time and it would be about 15 degrees celsius in their house and you're wearing a big keep your coat on and your and your shoes and stuff because it was it was so cold so um with respect to canada what i find appalling is when they use uh per capita emissions ah. in order to do this manipulation of the numbers so oh china's per capita is this compared to canada well you know canada is the second biggest country in the world it's got extreme temperatures with very few people who have to move around and we produce a, a lot of of energy and we have to have energy in order to to survive and now they want to compare that you know with the billion the over billion people in china i mean it's just such a manipulation yeah no it's absurd if we had a billion and a quarter people here we'd have low per capita too although exactly. it would still be relatively high just because of the fact that we are in an extremely cold uh, or hot country depending on what end of the year you're at you know we have like a 50 degree temperature uh, differential between yeah. seasons in Canada, Celsius. So, you know, that's that's pretty dramatic. So, and in yeah. fact, when Dr. Catherine Hayhoe was here for the Calgary Climate Symposium in 2017, she tried to threaten us with uh, the risk of a one degree warmer winter. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were all pretty happy to hear that was coming. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, you know, I wonder, like in places like Saskatchewan or Manitoba, which has extremely cold winters, um, I, I just don't see how they're supposed to heat their homes with electric heat and still be able to afford to feed their families. Mm -hmm. No, it would cost a, a ridiculous amount of money. We have uh, two or three recent reports by Robert Lyman on our blog uh, that show that, you know, the cost of, of trying to electrify or decarbonize the country would be just astronomical. And um, in fact, one, one report that he did on ballparking the costs of decarbonization, he said that um, uh, the cost, uh, he's referring to a report out of the States by Tanton, and he says, using Tanton's figures, that would place the cost of electrification at somewhere between US 2.7 trillion and Canadian 3.6 trillion um, or US 4.35 trillion Canadian 5.9 trillion. This does not include the stranded assets cost or the dead weight losses, which based on the value of proven oil and gas reserves alone would appear to be about 9.4 trillion. So what that breaks down to in something personal is a cost of Canadian uh, dollars 3.6 trillion is equal to $95,000 for every person in Canada or a foregone income of Canadian 9.4 trillion is equal to almost a quarter of a million Canadian per person or $1 million for a family of four. So that's what we would be losing if we went net zero. Oh my gosh. Oh my it's like, why don't you just give people a million dollars and let them, yeah. you know, do their life. Um, so this is a great segue into what I wanted to talk about net zero. Um, so net zero proposed by Justin Trudeau and, and the Paris Agreement and so on. I feel like this is a term that most people have no idea what it means. And it's spoken, I think, with such deliberate vagueness that people, it's just left to their imagination on what it actually means. And which, of course, is very convenient for a controversial policy shift. And so my thinking is that there's at least two different pathways uh, to net zero that are, are out there. And the one that people are being sold is that um, they'll be able to keep their car, they'll be able to have the same kind of lifestyle, the same house, the same kind of food and everything. We're just swapping one kind of energy for another People will just switch their jobs, you know, go from working in the petroleum and hydrocarbon industry, and they'll just switch over to this new one, which is a great job creator, apparently. And um, then the other pathway is a true zero emissions from human activity, meaning zero use of any hydrocarbons for any purpose. That means no plastics. Um, I, I'm not sure how they're going to make windmills and uh, electric cars without plastic and how we're going to do, 
any of our modern life or computers or anything, but that's another thing. And that we're going to need significant degrowth, as described by researchers from Norway. So um, there's this first pathway, which is, oh, we're just going to swap things over. But then the second one, which is what they've actually agreed to, I think, at Paris, is that we're going to have to do significant degrowth, um, which is a radical change of lifestyle, attitudes, value systems, everything. And I don't know, what what do you see as, as the implications of this? Would you agree with that sort of two pathway description? Yes, I think there are those two pathways. And I think that the implications for Canada would be debt, disaster, and the destruction of Canada as a nation, which we already see is in progress. Um, and that may be an intentional uh, outcome wanted by people who would like to snap up all of our tasty resources because we have everything and we're quite dumb. We're just giving them away. But, um, you know, I would suspect that part of the equation would be forcing carbon trading as carbon offsetting as a means of pretending that you're not really polluting because even though you may be using uh, fossil fuels for a certain purpose, um, you're actually buying these uh, carbon offsets. And so I think that generally people will be forced into a situation of carbon serfdom. And George Monbiot had this idea back in 2006 that to target, uh, to set a target of an annual carbon cap, which falls on the ski jump trajectory, and you use that cap to set a personal carbon ration. So yeah. every citizen is given a free quota of carbon dioxide. He or she spends it by buying gas and electricity, petrol and train and plane tickets. If you run out, you got to buy more from someone who has used less than their quota. So would that be Al Gore for perchance? <laughs> so this accounts for about 40% of the carbon dioxide we produce, he proposed, and the rest we really auctioned off to companies. So uh, I see a neo-feudalism on the horizon for Canada. And uh, I think people are sleepwalking right into it. Although a few people are waking up now, but you know, it is impossible to uh, power the country with wind and solar. And we just issued another report today, actually, just before I spoke with you, we put it on our blog uh, that uh, critiques the Pembina Institute's uh, analysis of renewables. And you know, people don't understand how the power grid works. It's extremely complicated. So it's quite easy for them to be bamboozled by people saying, oh yeah, well, you know, we can just put up more solar farms, solar panels on every house and you can have your own power generator at home. It's not gonna work that way. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. So, you know, it's really important that people understand that this kind of transition cannot happen without destroying this society, period. Right. There's and so what I want to just add to your point about personal carbon trading, because at the time the government was in the UK was um, a labor government and they had mm -hmm. Tina Fawcett from, I think she's from Oxford. She put forward this proposal for personal carbon trading. And at the mm -hmm. time, uh, I think then the government changed or something and the, and they said, you know what? People aren't ready for that yet. We're just going to put that to the side, but people aren't ready wow. for it. And she never let it go. So she, I think it was last year or the year before, she made this little video on YouTube about how personal carbon trading would work. And it's, it's as you described there. So they have it on your phone and it's a little app that follows you around and you're given a, a, a quota of yeah. how many emissions you can use and it's based on it's it's a smart uh it's it's interconnected with everything in your house and everything that you do so if you're playing too many video games it um it cuts you off or depending on how many appliances you're using or whatever and then if you have a car and you're driving it around, but you run out of credits, then you just trade with the nice guy who's riding his bike down the street or something. And and they show it as being just you, you just use your phone and and transfer over, buy credits from from the other guy. But, and oh. you know this sounds an awful lot like the Chinese social credit system. And yes. so if you if you 
segue from it, from the personal carbon trading and your emissions, what makes you a good citizen, right? And then suddenly it, it accounts for all of these other things, which we see they want to bring forward with the, the task force for um, climate and f financial disclosure. So if, if that gets translated as Mark Carney wants into every individual, then it's not much different than the social credit system. They'll just call it something else, a green pass or carbon pass or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, well, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, would Canadians then be restricted because we have such a higher footprint because of our living circumstances? You know, how, how can this be considered to be fair? If you live in a cold place, you get the same quota do you? I know. I mean, in Florida, <laughs> or or what about even within Canada? It will create division. So, will people in Vancouver get the same amount of credits as someone in Saskatchewan in winter, yeah. right? And and so, if it's if they're trying to be equitable, then you know it would just be a certain amount for every person, and every person would have the same thing. And anyway, I I don't I don't like that idea. <laughs> I don't even want to try and work out how it would be how it would work or anything like that, because it's just so wrong. It's anathema mm -hmm. to what we're supposed to be as a, as a free society. And that's not freedom. That's, as you say, it's serfdom. Yes. Well, you know, and it's interesting that James Hansen, the climate scientist, he's been working with the uh, citizens climate lobby and he was sending emails to Canadians asking them to sign a petition to uh, request a uh, carbon tax of $210 a ton. And oh. also he proposed that uh, people would have um, a debit card and at the beginning of the month, their carbon rebate would go onto this card and they would get more and more money the higher the carbon tax went. Now, I, I mean, I'm assuming he should know something about math being a scientist, but uh, the more people pay on a carbon tax, the less money they will have. They may get a carbon rebate, but at some point they're going to run out of jobs. The companies are going to leave the country. Uh, and, um, you know, if you actually get to net zero, you certainly won't be getting a carbon rebate. So uh, it's pretty interesting that he was interfering in Canadian affairs as a climate scientist pushing carbon taxes. Right. I mean, at that I'm just so shocked that he would, <laughs> I'm shocked, but not shocked that he would do something like that. It's yeah, yeah. creepy, very creepy. Um, which brings me to the idea of how we get to net zero, um, that it's going to cost a lot of money. And as Mark Carney says, and as the government says, their preference is for private equity to step in and finance the shift. Um, and, and I wonder about who benefits from all of this. If we have these, they're pushing these changes and then you have people like Mark Carney who works for Brookfield that's set to benefit from the changes that he's pushing governments to do and mm -hmm. And I think of BlackRock and trying to force investors to um, tow the ESG line and so on. And so who do you think benefits from all of this? Well, it's really become a, an issue of uh, state corporatism where, you know, governments and, and these transnational corporations, I wouldn't say ordinary domestic corporations, more so these transnational transnational ones, they're um, all in bed together. And these guys are benefiting hugely from these policies. And for instance, with BlackRock, um, you know, this is a bit of a sidebar, but I had wanted to talk a bit about the green finance issues. Um, like we found that McConnell Foundation out of uh, Down East gave a $10 million grant to BlackRock for renewables. <laughs> BlackRock yeah. is like the richest um, corporation in the world. Um, so, you know, it's very, very strange that a Canadian tax funded foundation, tax subsidized foundation would be giving 
a fairly large sum of money to one of you know the world's largest uh, what hedge fund or whatever they are, um, like BlackRock. And then we found that uh, the National Resources Defense Council also has investments in BlackRock. Um, you know, <laughs> which would seem to be a conflict of interest because the National uh, Resources Defense Council was one of the main bodies running the Tar Sands campaign. Right. Uh, right. You know, so there there seems to be a, a whole world of green finance that's developed a, a parallel economy if you like to the regular one and they're just sucking the real money out of the regular economy into this world of green finance where they have to use these esg rules now because you could never do traditional accounting and and arrive at uh, a viable conclusion on some of these projects you know if you know that a wind farm is not viable without all the subsidies and the flow through shares and the lack of environmental uh, impact requirements, uh, then you'd never finance it, right? But because it's got all these layered on goodies that the government gives and layered on subsidies, then in terms of ESG, then it's a viable project. So it's really, um, it's really a boondoggle. I mean, the closest thing that I can compare it to is tulipomania. And I think probably <laughs> it's going to collapse. Um, Tulipomania was in Holland in the 1600s where people were, they would pay uh, the price of a house or a ship just to get a tulip bulb or just to get the future offset of that tulip bulb. It was like a, a crazy mass insanity, rather like we have now with climate change. Yes. And you know what yeah. I find so distressing is that a smooth transition is being promised to people that we're just going to, it's going to be easy peasy. We're just going to gradually switch things over at the same time. They're saying we have to move really fast, but you know, there's those actively working to create a sudden collapse, like what you're talking about. And I think in particular of the researchers at the newly formed Cascade Institute, where their stated intent is to facilitate an entire system change. If this is so, what type of system do you think will replace our current one? Well, um, probably it may be that people are trying to use energy in place of money, um, you know, which would go back to this carbon, uh, personal carbon ration system. Um, but, you know, I, I I actually don't know, but if you read the um, fourth industrial revolution by Klaus Schwab, you'll see that um, you know they have big plans for the world at the World Economic Forum. I'm not sure that they can work, <laughs> but I do see how these kind of unusual accounting procedures are giving tremendous share value to big tech because they're perceived to be clean. Like a lot of people don't realize that um, the United Nations principles for responsible investment is about a thousand institutional investors. They hold about $90 trillion in assets under management. Their fiduciary guru is Al Gore and they're all climate obsessed. So, you know, that's a huge chunk of money in the world that's being moved in one direction. Um, and I don't know how it can uh, continue because um, a number of people foresee uh, massive bubbles in the renewable energy industry. In fact, in uh, 2018, I think it was, or 2019, the CEO of Iberdrola said that um, he was anticipating a global meltdown in the renewables industry on the, similar to Enron and Enron style end game. So for people who don't know, Enron was um, an energy company back in the late 1990s that was uh, very progressive, very innovative, deemed to be one of the best places to work in the United States. And um, it turned out that they had a lot of fishy accounting going on and it collapsed into ashes because of that. <laughs> so I think that I, 
I think that we're seeing that in the uh, push for all these climate change initiatives. And in fact, it may be that we are already propping them up. Yes, you know, absolutely. The UK is the center of green banking. And uh, if in fact, these markets are collapsing, then of course, someone like Mark Carney, who was the governor of the Bank of England would know about that. And uh, we do have a commentary from Henri Lepage who is a French economist, and he noted that in 2020, February the 20th, something broke in the world economic system. So he said he's not sure if COVID broke it or if COVID is the cover up for it. But, um, you know, I have my suspicions that the climate world began to collapse and that's why there's now a climate emergency. <laughs> it's because they're picking <laughs> up all these bad investments. But that's my personal point of view. Right. And what I find interesting is that with COP26, they, they really want to sort of double down on forcing not just institutional investors to go this route, but to bring the central banks into it as well. And if you start having all these different metrics to these ESG scores or TCFD uh, metrics or whatever, um, it basically it creates lots of jobs for accountants and it's no wonder then that they support it but it's the level of interference into an individual's everyday existence mm -hmm. will be unreal and and it's that right now they're saying it's just major companies it's just large organizations large institutional investors but it won't take long for it to filter down to the rest of us where you know the personal carbon trading and and everything and i is i believe it's a bubble but i i'm not quite sure how this how this will all play out um for forcing this transition because once they stop petroleum companies and hydrocarbon companies from having investors but they haven't replaced the infrastructure and the energy, I don't think this transition can be smooth. Well, let us assume perhaps that, um, as I met, mentioned before, based on William Kay's work, that um, that because fossil fuels are not evenly distributed in the world, what happens if they run these companies into bankruptcy in the democratic West, the other companies are already state owned. And so, um, they tried to create some kind of global governance of energy um, resources, which then some global group would dole out. Um, you know, is, is that the end game here? Um, and no companies would be privately owned. There would be no public shareholders, only these, whoever they are, self-appointed gurus would would be um managing energy i i don't know it's a very strange thing because of course you can't make wind and solar panels wind farms and solar panels without oil gas and coal and you need a lot of it so i don't know how these people can continue to dilute themselves that you can have wind and solar farms and not use any hydrocarbons it's impossible right. Right. Or to say that they can they can do this with just renewable energy. It makes no sense. And even from a materials point of view, like you mentioned, I mean, it's it's ludicrous. And if you speak with yeah. engineers, the engineers come back and say, are, are you crazy? That's that's a stupid idea. But um, it it's like the the engineering study from the Netherlands from from I think it was 2018. And the government said, OK, so tell us, what do we need to prepare for in order to go net zero? What materials should we start buying? Um, what are we going to need? And the study came back and said, well, you're going to need everything from uh -huh. like, whatever the global production is. You're going to need it all just for Holland. <laughs> and the government said, what? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> so if that's just for Holland and now you want all of Europe, you want all of Canada, you want all of America to go down this route, not to mention what's required to produce all these things and 
and whatnot. It's just, it's a, it's crazy. And with respect to hydrocarbons, they're a little more broadly distributed around the world than the rare earth elements that are required for solar panels and windmills. There's, mm -hmm. you know, it's more concentrated in certain countries. And unfortunately, right now where production is, it's not in Western countries. It tends to be the, the, there's deposits in the United States, but they ran afoul of environmentalists who didn't want the mining to go forward. Um, same thing in Canada. We have a lot of uh, potential for mm -hmm. the various rare earth elements and the, the federal government has a mining plan, but it's unclear how that's going to meet their biodiversity goals because they want well, the federal government wants to set aside 30% of Canadian land for biodiversity. But when you do that, you can't touch it. So if, uh, if these regions that they want to set aside happen to correspond with where these rare earth minerals deposits are located, then how do they plan on extracting them? How will this meet our climate goals? Right. And how will you extract them without fossil fuels? Exactly. So, like know, the last time I looked. And planes and everything. You need to build things. You need rebar. You need cement. So, you know, right. it's, uh, it's, a, it's ludicrous. Uh, so. And Sadly, you know, we have politicians um, making these decisions based on the advice of activists who are full of ideology and very low on facts. Right. Or they just, they say something, oh, look, I have this fact here. And when you say, well, no, that's not true, then they call you a denier. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I, I'm, I, I worry about the future of Canada when the leadership of all the main parties have bought into this. And Mark Murano was talking um, about his new book, Green Fraud. Mm -hmm. And he said one of the biggest mistakes that has been made is conceding the point that climate, the climate is changing and it, and it could be due to humanity. Because the minute you concede that point, especially the ones who say, well, yes, of course, humans are contributing to climate change and so on. The minute you concede that, you can't do anything else. Then all you're arguing about is, gee, what you're proposing is too expensive. And, and you lose the, the sort of moral position and the position of scientific inquiry to say, well, we're not quite sure. And what you're saying is not true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you know, we we are not having open civil debate on these topics. We're not having full cost benefit analysis provided. We have a great amount of hand waving. I remember seeing Mark Carney talking, uh, I think it was the Petersburg uh, conference and uh, talking about hydrogen as if, oh, well, this is very simple. You know, we can just quickly go to hydrogen. No problem. And <laughs> He's not a scientist, you know. Meanwhile, Professor Samuel Ferfari has written a book called The Hydrogen Illusion, and he's a chemist, and he actually worked on trying to uh, rein in hydrogen and make it usable for, you know, the other, the alternative energy. And he did that for like 20 years or something, and it's not possible. There's a huge energy loss in everything that you do with hydrogen. And it's also an extremely explosive, extremely flammable, um, dangerous, dangerous uh, element. It's not at all like natural gas, which we do know how to handle. And hydrogen can actually infiltrate metal. It embrittles metal. So people are talking, uh, you know, we've seen some news stories go by about how, well, we'll just pump hydrogen to your house instead of natural gas. We've already got the infrastructure. Well, no, you're going to have a lot of very serious, um, dangerous situations. And it, it's, it's impossible to me that high profile figures like Mike, Mark Carney, like Seamus O'Regan can be wandering around talking about hydrogen as if it's a done deal when it's not. Yes, and yeah. you know, hydrogen is the smallest molecule and, mm -hmm. <laughs> And it, like you said, it go, it goes through stuff and you have to make things really, really thick just to try and keep under control the stuff, the, the hydrogen that, that you want to 
run through it. I don't see how you'd have to repurpose um, the pipelines and reinforce them and so on. So I mean, I know they've been making this this case in the UK because they're trying to tell people that that they'll have to give up their natural gas boilers and convert everything to electric, but they know that their grid won't be able to handle it. So they said, well, until our grid's ready, we'll just pump hydrogen in. But it's not yeah. like you can have two houses natural gas and maybe these two houses over here will be hydrogen. You'd have to redo the entire area. And then right now in the UK, <laughs> there was just a few weeks ago, a natural gas explosion because people, I don't know what they do here. Maybe they're careless. I don't know. But there tends to be a fair number of natural gas problems. Hmm. Um, with hydrogen, I can't imagine how many <laughs> explosions. Yeah, well, it has the blast range of a football field. So exactly. you know, normally when uh, you have an explosion, a natural gas explosion, it's more concentrated to that house and maybe two or three beside. But this would take out the whole neighborhood. Um, and it's just not it's not ready for this kind of application no. and not to mention, you know, one of the engineers that I work with says that, uh, you know, in, it is used in industrial settings. And even so, there are some very serious accidents there, but in the industrial settings, they have instrumental monitoring, which an ordinary person would not have. So, you know, if it's leaking or anything. Um, and you have very strict safety protocols, which, you know, ordinary people won't follow them. I mean, if people won't even put a mask on properly. So why would they handle the hydrogen properly? And people just make the assumption it's the same as gasoline or it's the same as natural gas when it's a very different cap. So it's right. uh, so irresponsible of these uh, high profile people to be pushing it without actually having done the research. Well, I think they it's it's a case of where you get some research scientists who are like, oh, yeah, this would be great. We should do it um, from a perhaps perspective from the university. OK, that's a cool idea. Let's tr get, get some funding to try it. But they're selling it as like it's completely ready to go and, and we'll just, uh, you know, cross it over and, and no problem. But this goes back to the point about promising the smooth transition, because mm -hmm. I think the maybe there's some of the policy makers understand that it's not going to be smooth. And if people realized that it can't be a smooth transition, they would say, no, this is a bad idea. Let's not do this. And so mm -hmm. there's all of these other strategies being put forward in order to sort of prevent people from really thinking about yes. what it means. And, you know, there's probably not going to be a smooth transition. And so what, what then does that mean for, my family and my children and grandchildren and so on. Um, and I just kind of want to draw one other point that you mentioned, and that's the sort of cost benefit analysis, because like I said in the introduction, quite often we, we always hear about the costs of, oh my gosh, emissions are doing this and doing that, but we don't talk about what are the benefits of it. And I really like Alex Epstein's arguments about human flourishing and that there's actually a moral case for fossil fuels. And Marion Tupi has made some very good arguments about um, the benefits that have arisen to humanity and the planet from having um, fuel sources from hydrocarbons. So, you know, if we're going to go down this route, then I think we have to have a more robust conversation with people about what are the costs of doing so what's the benefits of of staying with what we've got and what we know and work and research a little more to find out things that might be better but to create an energy transition that is forced when it's not ready when we don't have anything yet to replace all i can see from that is that it will cause a lot of of destruction for people that mm -hmm. it will you know be a terrible thing for humanity Yes, I, I think, uh, well, Robert Lyman has just uh, done two new reports for us where he summarized the highlights from a JP Morgan report. And the JP Morgan report effectively said, look, we're going to be using fossil fuels for a long time. And they're recommending that people <laughs> invest in oil and gas. Uh, but the, the highlights, uh, one is called uh, speed bumps on the road to decarbonization and the other is hazards ahead. Um, and it's they're both on our blog, and, but it's quite 
amazing to see how far we are from any of the things that they're planning, like how far we are from going all EV. And, you know, one of my concerns is that we'll, we'll probably get stuck. For instance, on the EV issue, uh, professional engineer Kent Zare did an analysis in Canada, and he found that to meet the present EV policy in Canada, we would need to add 10,000 megawatts of additional power generation. So that would mean like about eight or 12 power plants like uh, Site C Dam or like Muskrat Falls. Both of those, by the way, have been in progress for years. Both of them are hugely over budget and both of them have technical difficulties that they're kind of stuck. <clears throat> so imagine if we start to force people to only buy EVs and we phase out fossil fuels and we don't have enough power generation. So we'll be, you know, disabled completely in the country. We won't be able, we won't have any mobility. We uh, won't have enough power perhaps even for our homes. Uh, yeah. Because people yeah. will be busy charging electric vehicles. Um, you know, they, the costs of trying to implement this, the charging stations, the additional wiring, you know, none of the existing wiring is set for the kind of load demand that would be from having all these electric vehicles. Um, so, you know, these are very complex things. And I think Vaclav Smil has written extensively about how these energy transitions take between 70 to 100 years. That's how, you know, the transition from wood to coal, coal to natural gas, natural gas um, to uh, the addition of nuclear and things like that. It takes a long time because you have to build out the appropriate infrastructure and it costs always a lot of money. And the other key point that Robert Lyman makes, these previous transitions have happened because the new thing was better. It exactly. was better, it was cheaper, more reliable, and that's why that there was a build out of infrastructure to support it. But wind and solar, these other renewables, geothermal, they're not better. They're far less reliable, they are far less accessible. They're all subsidized heavily, and people just simply can't afford to to uh, prop these up for for any longer. I don't think. I think it will all fall down. And then what happens is, I think, like you had pointed out before, that it's not like the Middle East is going to be shutting down its oil fields, and it's not yeah. like Russia is going to stop producing its oil and gas. And right now, Russia and China are investing heavily in developing oil and gas in the Arctic. So you've got these state companies who will then be left, and it will be, you know, either they're going to have to supply us because we won't have any investment, or they will buy up whatever assets are existing in Canada, maybe. Um, so it gives a, it shifts the power to the the state owned companies that will still be producing those things while making us dependent on them. And I, I keep waiting for an energy security person to come and speak out because mm -hmm. you you can't run a military on solar and wind. You can't run right. a military on electric. Uh, having electric tanks, like they were talking about at NATO, which is ridiculous. But, <laughs> you know, chi yeah, okay, excuse me, China, we, we can't engage right now because we have to charge. I mean, yeah, how exactly. does that even work? So, um, <laughs> with respect to the energy transition, that's a really good point. And I, I think, if I could add to that, is that every time we've developed a new energy that is more efficient, more reliable, more affordable, has has a better um, energy density, um, we've never actually completely replaced what came before. It's like we've sure. added and expanded. And so we still have wood burning. We still mm -hmm. have biomass, which is the burning of garbage or a dung or whatever. We still mm -hmm. have um, hydro, which has been around for a hundred and some years. We still have windmills, which have been around, you know, since the 1600s. And and so we've added to things. We've added nuclear. We've added. So, but now they're saying 
no, no petroleum at all, no fossil fuels at all. If you if you listen to some of these activists like uh, Zephyr Berman and her fossil mm-hmm. fuel non-proliferation treaty, which is an abomination, um, and they want a global registry of fossil fuels. Well, are you going to make Saudi Arabia sign this? I mean, who's who's the target for that? Well, it's the Western countries. So mm-hmm. then the West becomes weak. And from a geopolitical perspective, then that means that China and Russia and the ones who aren't jumping on this bandwagon will have strength and power. Yeah, and they'll just take over. I doubt that they'll come and buy a company. They'll just take the country. Well, I, you know, you could do yeah. it. You could just walk in because we won't yeah. have any ability to fight back. So, exactly. Yeah. So, I know it's. Uh. <laughs> But so if you had any advice for people on what they could do to sort of push back on this, what would you say to them? Well, first of all, I think you need to be informed about these things. And that's why we have a lot of different reports and videos. We have material that is mostly plain language. And we do have some that's a bit more complex for those who prefer the kind of more technical and scientific. But you need to inform yourself of uh, the uh, rebuttal argument, if you like, to the climate activists and to these energy proponents for renewables. Um, you need to not be gullible anymore. If you're a Canadian, you have to know that there's a green trade war against Canada. We are one of the richest countries in the world in terms of resources, and we are being walked all over and crushed sometimes by our own people. So if you love this country and want to fight for it, now is the time to not be gullible and play along with the tar sands campaign anymore. And, um, you know, you have to get engaged with your uh, political entities and inform them too, because, you know, there are many good people in politics, I believe, and they go along with what they're told. Uh, and the activists certainly have the ear of the government. If you look at the Canadian government lobbying registry, where I understand Mark Carney is not registered. In fact, I looked his <laughs> name up, but I didn't find him there. But if you look up any one of the big environmental groups in Canada, they all have like 5, 10, 15 people listed as lobbyists. And they are in and out of ministerial offices like practically every day of the week. So they have the ear of government, but they don't have the facts. They have the ideology. So I hope that people will get the facts, will inform themselves, and will take a stand and be willing to stand up and challenge people who tell you that you're a denier and say, I'm not a denier. You know, I'm a common sense, down to earth person, and I think we spent enough money on this. And I want to see a full cost benefit analysis. I want to see an open civil public debate on these matters with experts. So I think people have to be demanding of that because we don't have a lot of time left before our own personal resources and energies may be constrained severely. That's a very good point. Um, So do you have a website that you can tell people about? Yes, it's uh, Friends of Science, www.friendsofscience.org. And we also have a plain language, uh, more youth oriented one called climatechange101.ca. And uh, we have a blog, we have a YouTube uh, channel with lots of videos. We have a um, Facebook page, we're on LinkedIn, uh, we're on Instagram, and uh, We'd love to have you engage with us. We're on Twitter. So, uh, you know, we don't want people just to agree with us. That's the other thing. We're not into dogma, (laughs) even for our own point of view. We are quite open to discussion on all scientific and energy matters. And um, we just want people to be informed and to be willing to debate. I hope this helps um, spur some debate and conversation about these issues. And I just want to thank you so very much for taking the time to speak with me today. We've gone on a little long, but (laughs) it's been such a great conversation. And um, I really hope people will take the opportunity to check out the Friends of Science website and all of their other social media um, entities and help engage in the conversation so we can, 
we can have set, help set the course of our own future. Thank you, mm -hmm. Michelle. Thank you very much, Tammy. Thank you.